So we were hoping today to give you a brief overview of our experience planning a project-based learning experience for the group of sixth graders. So we'll start with our first little experience and then talk about a model that we grounded ourselves in to help us figure out how to do project-based learning in a really meaningful way. And then we'll talk about the next two iterations of our experience. Yep. And just the caveat we'll put down at the bottom is we're going to throw lots of information at you and there's a bit.ly link so you can have access to all this. In 25 minutes we can't possibly read and that may frustrate some of you depending on your learning style. So we apologize that we're going to whip through. And in, in case you're wondering what the heck is the ISS doing up there, if, if you thought you were getting a humanities project with the Charles Dickens, I'm a science guy. <laughs> partnered with Taj, and so these are science-based projects, but we're not so much talking about the design of a project in science. We're talking about the design of a project in general, and hopefully it transfers whether you're humanities, language arts, science, math. So that's our thinking today. Right. And here, here's our basic takeaway. This was our learning last year, is the difference between having a super engaging activity that students love, and we'll share an example of that, but that that's very different from grounded project-based learning. And, and that's what we learned through our three projects. Um, Buck Institute, that we'll refer to a couple times, refers to it, the difference between dessert and the full course meal. And so we'll hopefully show you our journey where we discovered that, because I've heard it, but I didn't know it until I saw the impact of it. So. So Alan came to me with a really awesome activity that he had done in several other schools and several other places. And it was taking photographs from the International Space Station. And I'll be honest, I had no prior knowledge of the International Space Station. I had no interest in space exploration. It was a leap of faith for me. But it sounded like a really cool activity. And because our school was in the process of implementing proficiency-based learning, I was like, oh, we can use this. We can totally attach this to some learning targets and use it to integrate. It's going to be great. And although I won't walk you through it completely, um, I have used this quite a bit. If you're sitting going, wow, having my kids take pictures from the International Space Station, that's something I'd like to do, right up here on the table, at the end of February, they're going to do it again. The instructions are there. My email is there. I can find a way to help you make that work. And I've done it with his youngest third graders. And it is one of those kind of wow experiences. So that's that. And even the link to all our sheets and things are in the documents here. So in implementing proficiency-based learning, we were trying to make our learning goals for students really transparent as well as the pathway to how to hit those goals and so trying to find different experiences for students to use to hit those targets was really important we thought well we have these really amazing pictures that students have taken <coughs> from the international space station they can use those pictures as evidence what a neat way to integrate evidence in a way that isn't just text-based so it was also a really awesome opportunity for us to use our one-to-one -one Chromebooks and to develop some responsible technology skills, as well as some just really practical technology skills. So we combined all of these wonderful ideas into a culminating project that we thought would knock the socks off of our students and us. Students needed to make a narrated PowerPoint using screencast by a cool tool that used their pictures as evidence to support a claim. And so here's an example. Maybe there's an example. Oh, so my claim about the connection between geography and civilization. My claim is topography or land land has strongly impacted the development of human civilization. And Positive things have many positive impacts and negative impacts. Some positive things it can be that it has many resources, such as water or trees, and flat land is good for farming. But it can also be the opposite of that, meaning resources can be low in some spots and flat land can be no protection from both trees. This is Mitchellville, Australia. As you can see, it's very flat. 
So we took that really awesome activity that kids were so stoked about, and we forced them to make these miserable products <laughs> that they didn't like making. We had to like pull teeth to get them to do it. And were absolutely horrible for me to sit down and watch 45 of. <laughs> yeah. We refer to it as a belly flop. It just kind of, I mean, it's like the dioramas that end up in the garbage after, after a project that you've done. So what did we miss? And so this is the Buck Institute model. And if you're looking for a guide to project-based learning, I would highly recommend this book. It's kind of the Buck Institute guide by John Learn. There's a couple of little handouts you're welcome to have that kind of have the elements here. But amazingly, to go back and look and say, wow, that had no authenticity. The students really didn't have choice. It wasn't a sustained inquiry. Let's not kid ourselves. That wasn't PDL. And so this is kind of the criteria we learned that, oh, maybe we better go back and do a little bit of analysis for ourselves of what project-based learning is. Because as we reflect on it, there were some really great things. The kids loved the project. They were going home and taking photographs and really using a lot of great technology skills to do it. And the technology piece? That is an innovative way to use Chromebooks. How often does a student get to take control of the camera on the International Space Station? That is a whole lot more than using it to write another essay. A lot of students did show real growth on that evidence scale, that analysis scale, especially between interpreting implicit evidence and explicit evidence, and really knowing the difference and being able to articulate it. And we wanted to build on video, and screencasting kind of showed us what the kids could do. It was kind of a formative assessment saying, boy, if we were to make videos, I don't want to watch those, they're not proud of those, who are they going to share those with? So, but we got to start. And then some of the things that really didn't work was Alan and I really forced that alignment between those targeted learning skills and that culminating project and the products we were getting. It really was a force. Okay. Background knowledge, I mean, that was another one. If we're going to have students do research, I mean, they didn't really have background in topography and the connection between civilizations and those. It was so forced that we didn't give ourselves time for it. And those products weren't really made for anyone except for me. If there was no genuine audience, students really didn't feel a deep connection to them or any real need to get it done or need to do it well outside of to please me, and that's really not a good enough reason. So project one, as Dickens would say, the worst of times. <laughs> but things got better for us. <coughs> so I want to show you the next problem, and this actually was a collaboration with Tasha's partner, Krista, who is the science connection. And we designed this problem as an engineering design problem. And we were continuing with the International Space Station theme. We were intentional with that, that that was going to kind of be some background that we wanted to give the students. And in this, it was looking at, can they make an insulator? Can they take something like this? And the, this had some technology involved. It included a data logger. And so could they insulate this simulating a battery and keep it cool in the heat extremes of space and keep it warm in the cold extremes of space? We were trying to work on energy transfer, is what we were trying to do. And we built off of an Apollo 13 thing. We were really intentional. We had a science target that we were working on teaching kids about, and we had a math target, I'm the sixth grade math teacher, that I really wanted to expose kids to and build their skills around. So we started with what skills we wanted to build, and then built this project around it. And we also really have some belief in design thinking, in the idea that we want students to learn to iterate, and. We literally introduced this as maybe the stupidest motto that could ever be introduced in a school. <laughs> Failure is, of course, an option. And we want the design thinking idea that, no, even the best engineers fail early, they fail often, they fail fast. And that's how they learn. And we followed this model to say, you're going to test, you're going to prototype, 
And it's not whether your design is fantastic, it's what you learn from your design. That's what scientists do. And so within this, this is kind of how the project worked. We had a set of materials that we could that we could genuinely say an astronaut could find these on the International Space Station, and working in groups gave them some very specific parameters that we're going to take something and we're going to warm it up, and you've got to make a device that keeps it cool. Another group that was our cryogenic group, we're going to take it, we're going to insert it into dry ice, and you've got to keep it warm, and we're going to measure those temperatures, because we were trying to get graphing and understanding data. So that was how that challenge worked. And from that, here are our first round products. Here are the insulators that were designed to withstand heat. Alan's wife was incredibly generous and let him put them in her oven at home. <laughs> and, you know, when you put a plastic bag in the oven, it doesn't smell good, it doesn't melt. Not especially an effective insulator. But from that, the students, each team received a graph. And they were so invested in understanding these graphs and understanding how they related to the model that they had designed. I've never seen kids dig that deeply into understanding a graph. It was amazing. And that was our math target. Can you understand that data and what it means? The next thing that you had to do was after they worked in their small groups to understand their design and what elements worked in it, they had to collaborate with the opposite group. So cryogenic teams and the teams that had to deal with the heat met, and they had to design an insulator that could withstand both heat and cold. And again, I've never seen sixth graders collaborate so genuinely over an academic subject. They were all invested in understanding each other's designs and designing something that could really hit those targets that Alan had laid out for them. So here's one of the models that they created so that their insulator could be recreated by someone else. And you can see real evidence of that collaborative learning. The trial one designs were all <laughs> over the place. But by the time we had gotten down to our trial two designs, they had really identified elements using the data from their graphs and their original designs to identify elements that helped with the heat transfer, help prevent that heat transfer and help keep those data loggers insulated. Finally, they had to use those models from their teammates as well as the graphs from each other's teams to decide which device was most successful, which insulator was most successful. Every sixth grader wants to say theirs was best, but they had to have real genuine evidence to prove it. And as you can see from this kiddo, who's not particularly the most engaged math student, he was working hard to understand how those graphs related to the designs and what that told him about the insulator. So, definitely growing in our knowledge of proficiency-based learning and project-based learning. Again, this was a really engaging activity that kids and parents were talking about. They wanted to work on it in their free time. Yeah. Again, introducing students to data loggers and remote sensing, that was really important to us. That, again, created use of technology. Also, just the graphing component, digital graphing, was something new for most of them. Really genuine problem solving and collaboration in a really meaningful way. And truly, you know, we learned as much from these failures as we did these successes. That we thought we really get the design element so that teams realize that this failure informed this learning, which is what we wanted to get with the engineering design thinking. And our end result that we see really showed their growth. We could use that as a summative assessment when they had to examine those graphs and identify which insulator was the most efficient and was the best. That was real evidence for us of their understanding. It wasn't just observational like it was in the first round of our project-based learning. And the data was 
it was relevant, it was authentic, it informed their thinking. So going forward, they had something, they wanted that sustained inquiry. Notice we have a lot more pluses this time, it was yeah. great. <laughs> um, one of our deltas was that teaching that modeling was really challenging, and models really didn't show a lot of growth from the beginning to the end. They were really basic. So we've decided not to even assess the modeling target. Yeah, and if we go back to our core energy transfer, again, students, they understood how to make a better design. <coughs> they understand co conduction, convection, reflection, those concepts. We could have gone much deeper in so that they were intentional and could explain, this is why this model worked and works better than this one. Didn't hit that as well as we'd like to. It was a great opportunity to slow down and do those things, but we didn't take the time to do that. Next time we might do it. We might really dig deep into those concepts. Okay. So our third project? Was really wonderful. We were presented with an opportunity based off of some work that Alan did, some background work, to have a downlink conversation with astronauts who are actually on the International Space Station. And it was a really powerful experience. Here's uh, just 30 seconds of the documentary that was made by a local organization about that. Champlain Valley School District, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Charlotte Central School in the Champlain Valley School District. How do you hear me? Welcome to the International Space Station. We've got you loud and clear. Okay, well, a lot more of that documentary if you want to watch it. The links are there. Um, and we want to share this as an opportunity available to any school in the country. They only do about five or six a year, but you apply for it. But there's also the opportunity through NASA to Skype an astronaut. And they pretty much guarantee if you give them five or six weeks, they'll hook you up with a genuine astronaut you can Skype in your classroom, which is one of those just motivating things. I'm kind of a space nut, so this was kind of my baby, but that gives me goosebumps any time I watch that. But I'm not a space nut. It was really awesome. <laughs> Uh, we learned from our Earth Camp experience that even though it was a really cool activity, if we didn't embed it in a meaningful way, that's all it was going to be. So we worked really hard to create something that would make this downlink really meaningful. So we came up with the challenge, can you create a two minute video that engages viewers in the excitement of an experiment that's taking place on the ISS? That's what the kids were meant to do after, I think it was like three weeks. About three weeks of post and the downlink was just one piece that actually kicked it off. Yeah. And part of that was a launch. We really, this quote that Alan brought to us, generate interest in the project by creating a special event that takes your class out of their routine and lets them know something special is about to happen. To help motivate our kids and get them really deeply invested we knew we had to do something a little different, and so we tapped into a existing resource, a NASA, a NASA education specialist, and Scott Black, this guy, it really didn't take all that much planning. It took about 20 minutes. He Skyped in, did a, a video conference with our students, and asked them that question. Can you guys create a video? Can you help NASA out and create this video for us? They were like ready to do anything for him. That's what our kids walk away and say, oh, NASA needs us, we're there. We're there. <laughs> and so again, we wanted to be really intentional about our design and not just have this be a really cool activity, but have it be grounded in the learning that we wanted them to be doing. So understanding testable questions in science Using that technology responsibly, sixth graders, notoriously, that's difficult. Adults, that's difficult. And then um, there's a humanities target that we wish we had had about presenting information. Okay, we partnered with RETN. If you don't know them, they're the local regional television network. 
And the same way, I just learned about the Folk Life Center in Middlebury. For these technology pieces, there are organizations around the state that want our kids to pick up tech schools. They came in and helped us learn how to edit, learn how to make video. It was no work on my part. Alan had set it up, which really helped, but they drove it. I told them what we wanted, and they did everything. And so? Even though we had set this wonderful project up, it wasn't like Alan and I could just step back and not do anything. There was a lot of teacher management that went into it, but it was a lot of student-directed learning. So there was a lot of choice. They had a lot of choice in this project. But Alan and I grouped them really intentionally to have supportive peer relationships. And they had to do a lot of critiquing and a lot of revising to make sure it was a worthy product. And so Alan and I set up a lot of opportunities and a lot of touch points for them. And sometimes it was peer to peer, sometimes it was peer to teacher, and sometimes it was just checkpointing against some of those standards, some of those um, scales. And we also had to really help them manage their time because this is a genuine public product. It was going to be presented at an open house and that local organization, RETN, was collecting all of this and posting it on their website. So it really was a driver for our students. But they came up with really amazing genuine products and it's evidenced by how many views there are. They're all housed on the RNTN website, and they've gotten over 10,000 views. Unlike me sitting alone in my classroom watching those miserable <laughs> videos. And we'll show you the beginning of one. Hi guys, I'm Charlie. And I'm Will. Some fuels burn really hot, then appear to go out. But they don't. They're cool flames now. They're just burning at a much lower temperature without any visible flames. In the experiment, they're using all types of alkane fuel for cool flames. The experiment is happening on the combustion rack on the ISS. The idea is to produce a working fuel without the excess heat. Almost all the energy is used to power... A little different from our product from the first one. <laughs> yeah. Pretty excited about those. There are 20 of them. They're, yeah, let's just say we're psyched. In terms of our reflections on that project, which we're going to rush through. So. Again, they loved it. Their parents loved it. We loved it. It was so much fun to do. We had the voice, the choice. They really built skills in a genuine way and asked wonderful questions. And I think we turned something that could have been just a dessert or an appetizer a down like into a project that had genuine learning with it. And we saw growth in all the targets that we had set out for this project. And that was because of our intentionality around how we built it. Especially the collaboration and the ability to solve problems. Yeah. And those public products got so much feedback. And the kids were so proud of them and so invested in them. <coughs> and we have a lot of students who are now talking about, oh, this is career options. I could do something with this. What do I need to do with math, Miss Gray, so that I can work at NASA? <laughs> yes, learn your facts. That's the first. Yeah. Um, every student was engaged. Every single student created a final product that's up in RITN, which is so huge. And a lot of them needed more scaffolding. Like I sat, Alan sat and did interview style videos with some kids, but everyone was involved. As we think about this year, this is our big challenge is um, to go deep in the science, we couldn't have the end of the conversation we want, but we did discover that there's another program, Skype the Scientist, and with about two to three weeks warning, you can identify a scientist in the life science, connect with them, that's what we're gonna do. We'll take each individual group, they can connect with them, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation saying, this is what I'm thinking, I don't understand this. So we're gonna try to leverage that technology in that way. And really take that opportunity to slow down go deep in the learning, and take advantage of their genuine interest. So, we won't ask you our question, but we would ask you, I know, in terms of neuropsychology, if we touched on something as you're thinking about a project, whether you flip over to the back or somewhere in your program, what gel? What gel for you? Because that was our goal, is to get you thinking about project-based learning. Not that you would duplicate our stuff, there's no need. You've got something great potential in your classroom and want you to hopefully take that project that you're doing to a new level. All right. That's what we're
we got. Thank you. Mm -hmm.